It's Thursday, and this is Set the Table. Welcome back. Uh, Thursday, June 4th, and Set the Table, episode 13. I am John, and here is Jack. How's it going, eh? And uh, on episode 13, we are talking party, composition, mission, and vision. Um, we're just a couple of nerds who like to sit around and talk about tabletop role-playing games. Um, so in the spirit of that, uh, I want to start off by talking a little bit about our 7C game. Uh, we had session one yesterday, and um, it's been it's been good. It was fun. It was. Um, 7C is a system that we've talked about on the show a couple of times. Uh, it is more narrative and scene driven than something like 5E, which is uh, a little bit more uh, high fantasy narrative mix with combat and all of this. I mean, 7C has combat and, and such as well, um, but it's, it plays a little bit more like a movie in, in that you've got scenes and you sort of do your roles and, and handle all the stuff within a scene and then there's a, a little passage of time or a little bit of travel and then you're at a next scene. Um, and that has, it's, it's interesting. Uh, it has been, it's been good so far. Um, I am playing uh, a character named Joseph, who is from the equivalent of that world's Germany. Uh, I am uh, uh, not an orphan, but my, my parents were sort of mysteriously killed in the country where I grew up, so I was sent to live with my aunt and uncle, and my uncle taught me dueling, and now I am a, a sword fighter who is looking to help this guy, uh, help this old painter find his daughter who he believes to be dead. So, pretty interesting, uh, so far. Um, I, I also played some, some 5e, uh, we played in my, my main game, and the party is deep in the intrigue of the city of Prosperous, the home city of Connie the Bard. Um, they were poisoned last night, and not last night, but last night in the game world. Uh, and so they woke up and tried to figure out what had happened and do some investigating, and Connie went, went and met with some of the folks that he knew in the city, and they went shopping a little bit and collected some information and are preparing for the perils that await them. Um, what about you? Did you play anything other than 7C? Well, we played 7C, and um, I was gonna say it was uh, it was you guys react. You guys switched gears very quickly. I, I was surprised. I thought we were gonna spend a lot of time in session one. There were there was only a few times when people asked to make kind of that 5E style, like, oh, can I roll perception to see what's going on? And it's like, well. Not really. If you want to run a risk, you need to set an approach, and then and then we'll put it back into the scene mechanic. But um, it was good. I, I I had a lot of fun GMing Seventh C. Um, good, good. I'm I'm still a little like the number of raises, setting the number of raises for certain activities. Um, I'm still kind of second guessing myself here and there, but. Other than that, it was it was it was it was well done, well done. Yeah, yeah, you as you well. Guys, I think that's something. Are, just like with like setting uh, like DCs for skill checks in in D and D, it's you know it's something that you learn as you go. Yeah, and, and I don't think it's as catastrophic as a skilled like if you if you set a challenge rating or a difficult or target number wrong. It can really impact that activity in those games where you set target numbers or challenge ratings or difficulty ratings or one of those things. Yeah. With Seventh C, you rolled four raises. Callie did. Um, no, you did when you went um, when you split the party and you said, "I'm I'm not going to stay in the school. Oh. I'm going to go and, and have a little mini adventure and and do some drinking and see if I can't find lodging for free." Um, 
and you rolled four raises, mm-hmm. uh, that was, I, 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 looking back, I wish I would have done something different to help move the story along just a little bit, but oh, well, that's all it, right. didn't, it didn't hurt, right? It wasn't, no, nothing, it didn't detract from your experience. It wasn't like, oh, you know, you needed six raises. Now you're sleeping in the gutter and, and now you're, you're having a bad time. Um, right. I think it was, it was, it was, um, but yeah, it's a learning, it's a learning experience. And, and I think we'll, uh, I'll get more comfortable the more I, the more I GM for 7C. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then our 5E campaign, uh, we're still going. Uh, it's, it's, um, we were more combat underground this time around. Um, and, and that's, yeah, it's, it's been, that, that game is getting a little repetitive. We're, mm-hmm. we're kind of wash, rinse, repeat. And I'm not sure if it's, uh, our dungeon master wants us to do more role play or wants us to, it's, it's kind of a sandboxy world. Yeah. Um, so I was talking to one of the other players. It's like, yeah, you know, I, I'm kind of not really sure where, what we're doing where we're going i kind of it's almost like okay it's, we get a time to make the donuts we go do our chores and then we take a rest and then we go shopping and then we get up in the morning and time to make the donuts we go do our chores <laughs> and then we have a little rest and then we go shopping it's, it feels a little uh yeah S- stale uh it's, it's it's not it not stale it's just we're we're kind of in a rut all right well yeah. that that's a good segue to lean into what we're going to be talking about tonight a little bit better. Um, the hope is that we we talk about you know sort of party composition uh, from perhaps a little bit more of a mechanical standpoint, and then party vision and mission, which is a little bit more the RP fluff standpoint. Um, and and I think. Your situation is a party needing a mission, and that's sort of your DM's job. Um, but we can chat about that a little bit more later. Um, we we started. We had session one of seven C yesterday, uh, but a week prior on Wednesday we had our session zero. And we spent a good chunk of our session zero creating characters and talking about, you know, how that system is structured and what sort of roles we need our characters to fill. Um, Because when we first started talking about 7C, that was my sort of primary hang-up was, well, I don't know what kind of character to make because I don't know what kind of characters I'm going to be with. Um, And and the characters that you're going to be with sort of impact your vision and your mission and how you interact with them. So... Um, we thought that it would be prudent to sort of reflect on that session zero and talk about party, comp, mission, and vision. Um, so sort of like I like to do when we start talking about something where we're using terms that we're very familiar with, but a new, you know, a a new tabletop DM or GM might not be, um, is talking about party composition. Um... And I know you've got a note in here, but th- sort of the standard party comp that derives from, you know, MMOs and other video game environments um, is, is your your tank, your DPS, your healer, um, sort of your your holy RPG trinity of warrior, wizard, rogue. Um, and, and you note that this isn't you note that this isn't something that was considered very strongly but I'm curious to hear more about that considering like how common warrior wizard rogue is so so who's the healer in warrior wizard rogue so you you tended not to have a healer in those things uh, like the oldest thing that I can think of would be like gauntlet right um and, and you've got healing potions and food, and healing is, is limited because that's important to the, the system mechanically. Um, I think in that scenario, I would call it uh, tank damage support, and the wizard would definitely be a support. Okay. 
Because I, I just, I, I look at, like, when we talk about standard party composition, and, and yeah, you've got tank damage per second, that's DPS, and heals, right? That's a very World of Warcraft, um, Star Wars The Old Republic, right? Pick, pick your favorite MMO. Um, I think Pirates of the Burning Sea is the only one that doesn't have that kind of makeup where there's a class of characters who are really good at, at fighting and not taking a lot of damage. There's a lot, there's a set of characters who do a lot, you know, glass, the glass cannon. They do, they do lots of damage, um, but they, they aren't necessarily well defended. And then you have that support, right? They heal, they bless, they buff. Um, and, and that's much, much more a video game, uh, modality. It's also very fantasy. I mean, you have that in Drizzt. You have that in Lord of the yeah, Rings. You know, I was thinking about when when we when I wrote that, I started thinking about that, and it's like, so who's the healer? Um, Br- Bruner's a fighter. Yep. Drizzt is a ranger. Who's who's the heals? So so again, I, I think he. You're right that healing definitely comes from from video game. You know, I got to get my red bar up. Um, I think historically that I really I probably should just rename the whole role of support. Um, yeah. Because uh, even in you know the the Trinity Warrior Wizard Rogue, Warrior is soaking the damage. Wizard is dishing out mad damage fireballs, and Rogue could be your support there too, um, being that they are disarming traps and eliminating particular enemies. Uh, mitigating, right? So, so healing is just mitigating damage. Right. So, a rogue who disarms a trap is mitigating damage. Um, I don't think there anybody would call a rogue a healer, but I would definitely call a rogue a support. So, yeah. you got Regis yeah. in the Legend of Drizzt, who is a supporting character who helps the party by having various social connections and knowledge that makes it so that they aren't as in danger as they would have been. Um, in in the Lord of in the movies for Lord of the Rings at least you've got Arwen um, who who does some some elvish healing and is yeah. sort of a, a social yeah. support character. Um, I think of that too in terms of 7C um, that we our group in 7C consists of my character who is a uh, sort of a melee DPS um, and uh, yeah, sorry, I skipped ahead a bit. Um, when we say tank, we mean uh, a frontliner. So this is somebody who has more hit points, a higher armor class, um, or or in a more roleplay focused system, just a higher constitution or mental resilience. So I'm, I'm thinking like Call of Cthulhu, where you don't have a, a tank in old Victorian England, but you've got the the studious uh, old guy who's got this wonderful degree of mental resilience and isn't going to be as terrified at the eldritch horrors of the night. Um, and and that's well, we have we, that's that's further on in my notes when, when we start talking about various how different systems handle this. Yeah, um, because some of those games like Call of Cthulhu, uh, the party is in in mo i mean I, I hate to use the word should but the the plan for a call of cthulhu game is that there is just kind of a bunch of people either right it's the friday evening crew who's having dinner at the diner or it's the folks on the number five bus from um from scranton it's um <laughs> It's just it's nice. a collection of of average day people, and then the mythos happens, and they're thrust into this situation. Um, yeah, even so, those so, average people have skills that separate their abilities, right? Sure, and 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 this, I mean, it's in the back of my mind. I didn't put it in the notes, but it, but we're we're also engaging in a little bit of metagaming here oh very um, much so very so much so by by building a party 
and kind of looking at skills and saying, oh, you, you've got a lot of physical attributes, but not a lot of social attributes. I'll play a character with some social attributes, but I won't necessarily put a lot of points in my physical attributes. And then mm. someone along the, someone goes, well, you're very social. You're not very strong, but you're also not clever. You're not your you, your wits, your intelligence, your wisdom. You know, you 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 dumped everything into charisma. So I'll you know I'll be that third person who's kind of the smarty pants. Yeah, um, we kind of do this though. Like if you're building a team of people, you know, to make a video game, say, you know, you've got your creative yeah. artist types, you've got your logic brained programmer types, you've got your social producers. Um, I, I think. Yeah, labeling the standard comp as tank DPS healer is a bit of a misnomer. Um, yeah. And it, it really should just be sort of a, a triad of skills from, I guess you could say, like physical, mental, social. Again, that it's system dependent. Um, but it, but that is that is some metagaming. And, the, I mean, the other thing to consider is, let's say you have a group and your players are all it's like we are a den of warlocks we all you know five people sitting around the table everybody wants to be a warlock it's like okay cool yeah no it's very cool as the dm just remember that you've got a table full of warlocks and kind of tailor your their experience towards their strengths right Mm -hmm. I mean, even even with a table full of warlocks, you're going to have warlocks who are more skilled at arcana and nature and have higher wisdoms and intelligences. And you're going to have warlocks who have higher constitution and and take things that let them use medium armor that they will find themselves into roles, um, you know, just just from the merit of being different people with different backstories. Sure, and and I'm I'm thinking probably the, the the one place where balance is almost universally achieved is paranoia. If you if you follow the mm. character creation rules in paranoia, um, you actually create your clone in session zero as a team exercise. Oh, and, interesting! And it's, it's clever because it 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 not only balances out the, the the party members, it creates some animosity between the players. Right, because you – I think you've told me about this before. You you bid? So you just you, – you pick, right? So I'm looking at my – I'm looking at my character sheet and I go – Oh, right, right. I want to be good at using weapons. I'm going to take weapon – I'm going to take three points in weapons plus three. And then and if, if you're sitting to my left, John, now you have to put a minus three somewhere on your sheet. Yeah. Yep. And you Very could cool. say, well, I wanted to be a guy with weapons. I'll, I'll take this minus three and I'll put it in repair. So I'm, I, you know, hand me a wrench and I'm going to hit you with it. I won't be able to turn bolts, mm-hmm. um, and then, but then you get to you get. Oh, I'll take two points in um, programming, computer programming, and it's like, oh, okay. Well, now I've so it goes around the table, right? And it creates these kind of little, yeah. I wanted I wanted to be the smarty pants, but I had this negative three now that I have to deal with thanks to you. Yeah, um, it but does. That's, take away some agency and character creation where like I, I've mentioned 10 candles before. And for yeah. that, you write, you know, a good thing and you pass that left and you write a bad thing and you pass that right and so on until you've got your character. Um, but that, I, I don't know, that feels more agentic than, you know, Oh, the person on the right of me gets to pick what I'm bad at. So they just, you, you're bad at something. You pick what it is. Oh, all right, all right. Yeah, you, you don't have to put the negative three into gu- into firearms. You can put the in, you can give yourself two points in firearms or th- even four points in firearms, 
you just have to take a negative three in something somewhere. Okay. All yeah. right. Yeah. And, and again, that's, but that's, that's paranoia. You've got six, a six pack of clones. You won't get full experience points. If you don't lose some of the clones, the computer is going to wind up killing half of your clones anyway. <laughs> um, and then your other party members, your friends, I'm doing air quotes. You can't see them, but your friends, right. Are going to, turn you in for treason or push you down a garbage chute when you're not paying attention because they want your blaster pistol. Cause it's nicer. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's dark humor. So it's, it's all done in, in fun. Nice. Um, so, but if, uh, but we've you, said, but if you look, I'm, I'm, I'll bring us back to the conversation. If you look at the appendix N literature, right? All of the kind of, fantasy sci-fi tales of the weird written prior to 74 right before there was dungeons and dragons to influence creative folks um you'll like you mentioned lord of the rings there's the hobbits and a ranger aragorn the archer the dwarf boromir they're all kind of and gandalf the wizard Right. Um, it's it's a fellowship with different talents, but there really aren't specific character classes, right? I mean, Gandalf's a wizard, but he uses a long sword. So, depending on which rules system, that's a foul. <laughs> that's um, gonna be older, older stuff, right? Well, yeah. So, so in advanced D and D, um. Wizards were restricted to daggers and staffs. Okay. It, it was you. You pick up. You couldn't use a longsword, basically. Mm-hmm. But right. um. But yeah, and I'm trying to think like, like Fafford and the Gray Mouser, uh, big big burly barbarian and a rogue. Yeah. Uh, you just don't have uh. You got a tank and a support. Right. Um, I'm just I'm trying to think of other examples like the Black Cauldron. You had a bard, a fighter, and a magic user. Yep, three right there. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then Gurky. What? And then Gurky. Right, comic relief. Yes. Sorry, I, it's been a long time. <laughs> no. Yep. We were just, um, I was just talking about that with with somebody the other day, the the Black Cauldron books, but that's probably yeah. worth a reread. Um, so so we said tank a couple times. We clarified that. Uh, we say DPS, uh, which mean like you said means damage per second. That definitely directly comes from from video games. Uh, yeah. you, you can just say damage. Um, and oftentimes that gets split into uh, a melee, a ranged, and a spell subcategory. Um, so we, you know, we met Gandalf being, uh, well, kind of a hybrid of that melee versus spell because he does have the longsword. But um, I'm thinking Avatar from Wizards actually was what came to mind <laughs> oh wow that's it, that's a throwback huh 1976 yeah um and that's spell spell support more than anything yeah um but but that's that's dps when we say it and then healer slash support i think i just say healer instinctively but i mean support um classic examples are your priests your bards nope not your bards uh clerics um and bards Bards to yeah, bards to a lesser degree, um, and then uh, I think more recently, uh, particularly in across the D and D spectrum, um, it used to be that classes seemed a little bit more uh, diverse, and now it seems like there's a little bit more homogenization happening, um, and you've got more sort of hybrid classes where a paladin can be a, a tank any kind of, of DPS. You could have a, a paladin with a greatsword, a paladin with a bow, or a paladin who you you know uses a staff or wands or something. You um, know, the, it's it's interesting that you say that, and it's not in the notes anywhere, but I, it, it really makes me start to think about, because we had talked about, hey, Gandalf really isn't a magic user, a, a D&D magic user, because he's got a longsword. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and and as I look back, some of those older games had some very clear like if you were if you were a rogue, you could wear leather armor and that's it. And if yep. you were and 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 just there were some very strict. I mean, Dungeon Crawl Classics has gone back to that, right? Where mm-hmm. it, you want to play a dwarf? Cool, that's your class. Class, you know, racist class: dwarf, elf, halfling, um, and warrior, and thief, one, wizard, cleric. Right? It, yeah, priest or yeah, no cleric. They call it a cleric too. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it's very clear. Like these are the things you can do. Um, you, you know, only warriors get the, the bonus, um, feet die, the feet of strength die. Only wizards can spell burn. Uh, only thieves can rejuvenate their luck. They're very strict kind of, and, and, and older games that was, that was like very popular. And, and I'll go back to world of warcraft right if you played vanilla world of warcraft and you wanted to be a paladin you had one faction to pick from and two races right you could be a a human paladin or a dwarf paladin yep if if i'm remembering correctly and if you wanted to be a shaman well that's great you've got to play horde and you've got to be either a tauren or a troll Orc. Um, or orc. So, so there were some very like clear delineations between classes in older games, and I think as as the industry matured and as people were kind of like, you know, Gandalf uses a sword. Why can't I? Why, have, why, why can't, can't I? I? Be, why can't I be a wizard with a long sword? And people, we haven't talked a lot about home ruling, but that's a good place for a home rule right there. Mm-hmm. Right. I, um, I think you just want the agency, right? You want I, I've got this cool idea for a character, but I, I can't play it in this game. So I either need to play a different game, or how do I play it in this game? You have to yeah. you have to homebrew. Well, I, I think the risk, and and we're again we're kind of off the rails here. No, this is great. The the risk is that you get what happens to you is what happened to Pathfinder First Edition, right? At the at the end of the path Pathfinder first edition kind of life cycle, there were forty classes, which I think is tremendous. I think that's great. That's like the one thing that I will praise Pathfinder for. I mean, it was, and and some some of them were like the vigilante. It's a cool idea, right? Who wouldn't want to be Zorro or Batman? Or the Green Hornet, or the Blue Morpho, right? I mean, that's a, you know, you've got a secret identity, and you do these cool, epic things. Um, it's a great idea. I just don't know. I mean, why can't you just be a rogue? Because <laughs> I, I don't want to be just a rogue. I want to be a rogue that can cast a spell, because that's tricky. And in Skyrim, I played a rogue, but I still had illusion magic so that I could make my my footfall silent yeah and and i i I guess i'm not upset about that i i i just i'm just asking the question like no i got i i got it you know what i'm saying i'm i'm not you know shit i'd love to play a game where i where i was a a vigilante i think that'd be a blast um that's one of the character classes that's on my short list yeah Uh, i think it, it comes down to whether or not you need class mechanics or if you just want it to be part of your backstory and i think 5e does that well uh, fairly well i'll say you know three mm-hmm. stars um where you've got a pretty big list of backgrounds now um where if you want to be you know i could be a fighter who uses a great sword and I could, my background could be that of an archaeologist, and I just happen to be uh, intelligent and and kind of you know brutish in my manner, and I I carry a sword to protect protect myself because I'm in dangerous places. Or I could be that very same greatsword fighter with the sage background, 
and I am some well-read person, like very like Sun Tzu's Art of War well-read mm -hmm. um, fighter who prefers, you know, the strategy of combat as opposed to, you know, the bloodlust that maybe a barbarian feels. Uh, and no, maybe that's and I, where, maybe that's where Pathfinder started to to slip a little bit was that some of those classes could have just been backgrounds if you had written a little bit for the background of your character. And and I think Starfinder has has kind of gone in an interesting direction where you have hmm. you obviously have a race, yeah, um, and then they have the themes and the classes, yeah. So Numenera too, and 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 actually Numenera has is a whole different ball of wax, right? They well, it's not altogether different from Starfinder, right? You know, um, I well, so first, so second edition New, Numenera added two more classes. Ooh, okay. So you had the Glaive and the Jack and the Nano. And now there is a right and a skull. Um, so so I, know, the, I know Glaive was your your melee combat. Your yep. Jack was your bard rogue, char yep. charismatic, and your Nano was your sort of techno wizard. Yep. Scald is a bard. Okay. And a right is like an engineer, someone who messes with artifacts oh, and, and takes them apart and puts them back together again so very cool um alchemist engineer kind of thing but but that's that's another game where i think it's harder to metagame like we're talking about putting together parties sure you can say i'm gonna have a glaive uh a nano and a jack right one of each let's have one of each it's it's kind of a it reminds me a lot of Destiny. I said that when I first started reading Numenera, that it reminded me a lot of the video game Destiny with the uh, mm. Warlock, the Hunter, and the... Um, Titan. Titan, right? Um, the Titan's the Glaive, the Warlock's the Nano, and the Hunter's kind of the Jack. Um, yeah. A lot of but, games are doing... Like, Anthem did a four-class system. Yeah. Deep Rock Galactic has a four-class system, but... But that's but with with Numenera, right? You create your character in a single sentence, right? I my my name is Frederick, and I am a <laughs> glaive who um, worships lightning, right? So it's a yeah, you've got a, a something and a subject, right? Adverb, yes, right? Adverb and a subject. And it's it's brilliant, but you could I mean you could have three glaives. You could have a a glaive that cures the sick, right? And that's more of a paladin healer type. Yeah, um, you've got your glaive who worships yes. lightning, and that's your DPS. And then you could have your your glaive with skin of stone, right? And then there you go, boom. There you go. You've got a you've got a three glaive party, uh, and they're all uh, filling different roles. Yeah. Which I, I, I think that, as, as I don't know, I feel like I get maybe just a little bit wary about calling it metagaming. Because if I had three different people come to the table and all of them are like, I want to be an assassin rogue who is good at picking locks and killing people. Like, three people with exactly the same skill set just isn't... It's not going to be fun for people because it's not going to be... You're not going to have moments where you are novel or moments where only you can get the party through. It's just going to be, oh, well, who, who rolled the best and, and you get to do the thing. Um, it, it's kind of like playing more of a solo game at that point. And it's, I don't, it, it shouldn't be. I, I'm, I'm wondering, though, if you had a party like that, you could do some kind of. Oh, I, I mean, absolutely if, could. If you're playing, if you, I mean, if you're playing, if you're like, we're we're playing Skull and Shackles, right? We've got a pre-can module, and it's three assassins. It's like, uh, yeah, this this is gonna be interesting. But if it if you were homebrewing or running a your own kind of story, mm -hmm. right? You've got three assassins. Well, now let's do, you know, a Boondock Saints style. Right, you the three totally. of you have to go kill that guy because he's a jerk, or you're getting paid, or whatever. Yeah, um, you do like a an adventure in the thieves guild sort of. 
sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. No, it, it would be great. I, and I, I would like to take this opportunity to, you know, for D, new DM tip, um, encourage your players not to worry about roll. And I know my, my last comment was literally, well, make sure everybody's not playing the exact same thing. Um, but I, I stress it a lot when I have new people coming into my games or when I have uh, older players changing characters, not to worry about the roles that you're filling. Like, just play the character that you want to play. And more often than not, people don't want to play the exact same character as somebody else. Um, but but I, I try to stress that in my group, that you should play what you have fun playing and that you've got fantasy that you want to embrace and not worry about, oh, well, we don't have anybody who can heal. Right, but if you are forced to play a cleric and you're not going to have fun, then don't do it. <laughs> right. Um, and and cool. I totally could DM for a group of three rogues or, or th three druids or three fighters. Um you know that as as long as the players are having fun, you know, write the story that they would enjoy. Sure. Um, I've lost my place in the notes. <laughs> oh, that's all right. Uh, I, we 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 sort of got sidetracked uh, when I was talking about hybrid classes, being that okay. you know a paladin can sort of do anything, and in more recent game systems, you know, particularly five e, there's a little bit of uh, homogenization between classes, um, where, uh, you know, a, a paladin, a druid, a monk, and to a lesser extent, bard and cleric all could do every role. Um, and you could have a party full of them and, and have it be very different. Um, Druid might be the best example where, you know, you could have a druid be a bear, you could have a druid be a cat, and you could have a druid stay as a caster. Very World of Warcraft, but, um, yeah. you know, you could do that. Um, and I, I, I liked where we went there, talking about how there are systems that sort of alleviate that and, and have very different classes or have so many classes that, you know, you don't really need to worry about it because you're going to, nobody's going to, your, your party isn't going to have a really bad time because there's nobody there who can successfully climb a rope. Um, right. Unless you are, like you said, playing a, a pre-packed module that like you really have to have somebody. And maybe that's part of the, maybe that's a symptom of part of the problem too, is that, you know, if you are playing Curse of Strahd or, or uh, Skull and Shackles, you, you kind of need people to fill those roles. Um, and I, again, I don't know that I would go so far as to, to call it metagaming, because even on a, a ship, you've got a doctor and a quartermaster and a cannoneer and a navigator. Um, and a cook, a, and a carpenter, and a sail, a, a sail maker. Yeah, you've got right? all the you've roles. Got all these different roles. Now... Skull and Shackles would break if you had five lawful good paladins. Well, so that's alignment more than class, right? Well, it's kind kind of backstory, like right. Yeah, you, that's that's yeah, that, me bringing Osric to a dungeon crawl when he wants so bad to have a, a story. Right, like you wouldn't bring that lawful good paladin onto a pirate ship. But he wouldn't stay long, right? That's the problem. No, and uh, but that's. Yeah, and and there, there like we were talking about other systems like paranoia, where you create your characters as a as a group, um, and we also kind of highlighted Call of Cthulhu, where and that's that actually feeds into that. One of the things with classes, picking a class and and having di diverse classes around the table is mm -hmm. that's kind of how people are progressing in the game. So, it's like I'm playing a monk. I'm going to get really good at Kung Fu. I'm going to get lots of movement. I'm like that. That's why you're progressing that character. Um, Cause that's kind of the story that you want to experience. Yeah. And, and, and other game systems are different and a, a basic role play game, right? Call of Cthulhu, Rune Quest, uh, all the, all the stuff from our friends at Chaosium doesn't have a, a progression track like well, well that's not D, D. 
Well, right, it's not like D and D because it's a different system. But Call of Cthulhu, sure. you still level up the skills you use. The skills that you use, right? So if you're a newspaper reporter, you you start the game as a newspaper reporter, and you're on this train. It's winding through New England, and people start turning into puddles of of goo in their seat, and you're trying to figure out what's going on. If you don't use your camera or you don't write any news stories during the whole adventure, then you didn't use any of your journalism skills, and those don't improve. Right. So uh, for folks who aren't familiar with it, uh, you've got your list of skills, and if you use it at all during the adventure, you put a little check by it. And at the end, when you would do your your level up, so to speak, um, you get to increase the skills that you have checked, right? It's a, it's, it's a real life experience, uh, experience yes. system where like in 5e, every four levels, you get your ability score increase and you say, oh, I, I'm stronger now. Although to be fair, I do think that to be fair, um, to be fair. <laughs> I do think that that sort of a system in 5e would be redundant because your fighter is obviously hitting things with his strength and your rogue is obviously sneaking about being dexterous. Like, Yes. Yeah, you, you've already kind of picked your role where in RuneQuest or Call of Cthulhu, like, I, I'm a newspaper reporter and I'm on this train and this weird thing is happening and I'm trying to figure out what's happening. There isn't an opportunity for me to do journalism. So I, I don't fit the role of a newspaper photographer. I'm now investigating i might get into a scuffle where i have to punch somebody so i'm in fisticuffs i'm i'm working out puzzles with mathematics like I, you're using a different set of skills than um your class and I, and I think that's one of the things i really enjoy about a game like call of cthulhu is it you really are just an every person like you're a newspaper reporter, you're a fry cook, you're a waitress, you're a uh, insurance salesman, and boom, you're you're in this setting. Right. Um, you still have skills. You do, and and your skills are based on your previous life. Like your insurance salesman is a whiz at math, and and library usage and accounting, bookkeeping, I think is this is this is the skill mm -hmm. on the character sheet, but. If he doesn't do any accounting work while he's on the train, right? He he doesn't improve that that skill. Right, right. It doesn't. It, I guess it. You still it does got. Is, you still got a you, sixty in it, right? And your sure, brawling you, goes yeah. from zero to ten if you, you got in brawling, your scuffle. Right. You get you get you get in your fisticuffs and you come out of it um, relatively unbruised. You get to improve your your brawl. Right. Um, you still have. But, class identity you you do but you're not hampered by it and i, and I do, i'm not saying that you know if, if i'm playing a cleric in 5e i'm hampered I, i'm it's no you can have a blast playing a cleric and you can do all sorts of fabulous things and have great agency in the game mm -hmm. but at the end of the day you're a cleric and right. and people are going to have expectations of you where in a game like call of cthulhu you could be like, yep, yeah, I, I am, and I was an, I'm, yeah. When, when, uh, but when I boarded the train this morning, I was an accountant. Now, I'm a fighter, and I'm searching, and I'm fit, filling a different role. Yeah, you're, you don't lose those skills though. Like you're still an no, accountant. No, no, no. Like no, if we come to a, a puzzle that is lots of math to open an Eldritch Gate, I'm, I'm handing you the notes. Like yes, I, yep. You still have the, and I, I, I don't say that to like try to homogenize them, but I feel like if you're, if you're playing a game, you want an identity in that game, and I think what the, we historically have have used to define that identity is the term class right um so I, I didn't want it to sound like you don't have a class or a role because you, you do and and having that role is important right that's the belongings section of maslow's hierarchy right um right. like one, once you've got your food and water and you're not at risk of death then you want somewhere to fit in um right 
and and I I I like that there are enough systems that do that in a different way because I do like the experience system of Call of Cthulhu for sure. Um, and the character generation system in RuneQuest Glorantha is brilliant. You want that one? You actually start by rolling stats for your grandparents. Oh right, you've you've mentioned this to me a little bit. So, uh, so, off so the in show. Rune, Rune, RuneQuest Glorantha is from Chaosium Games. It's um, it, it's brilliant. It, the 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 world is totally immersive. Um, the author's name is escaping me right now greg stafford i knew i would remember it right um the world is immersive and massive and beautiful and well written and character creation starts with rolling rolling stats on a table for your grandparents and then your parents and then you and as you're growing, so as you're kind of growing and developing as a character during character creation, you're like, well, I sat at my maternal grandfather's knee and listened to his stories because he rode buffalo in, in the war. And, and that always impressed me. So it helps you kind of build out your backstory without having to start from scratch. Very cool. And then when you're building the party, since... It's a Bronze Age um, era that the world is in, uh, and it's a very tribal, very city-state. More often than not, you grew up with the party members. They are your cousins, your brothers, the family that had the, the hut next to you. Um, and so that kind of vision, mission, cohesion is also taken care of. Where Yeah, it's sort of baked in. A game like Call of Cthulhu is like, hey, you're the you're the seven poor slobs who were at the diner when the tentacle came out of the coffee pot. Sucks to be you. <laughs> Where uh, Glorantha is, yeah, hey, you're you're in this tribal unit, and the th three of you are gonna go to, you know, you're gonna go across the river and across the mountain and see why the gods won't make it rain. And and you get together with your family and and go, so. And, and I cool. think that's that's an interesting. That's like fellowship forming the fellowship in the the one ring. That's that's another one of those kind of. Um, yeah, I think it's a spectrum, right? There there <laughs> games like the One Ring and Rune Quest that do, this very very well, and then there are other games like. Dungeon Crawl Classics, where hey. <laughs> There's a group of 20 of you, and, and you've all been talked into going and looking for this portal under the stars, which is supposed to magically show up at the harvest moon. And Yeah, you whoever, want something, you, you're ready for something different in your life, and you're the 20 yeah. people from the village. And who whoever lives, that. those are the people you're actually going to play for future campaigns. <laughs> which is super fun. It is a lot of fun. Um, yeah, yeah and then, I think... 5e pathfinder is somewhere in the middle right uh well uh, yeah yeah I, th I think 5e pathfinder you know encompasses the whole spectrum because it really just depends on you know what you're what you as a group decide in your session zero um and even in something like call of cthulhu you could just you could decide like hey we're a family on vacation we've we've all known each other our whole lives we all do different things that these are our characters or you could have the you're the five people who happened to be enjoying a coffee at 10 p.m. when the tentacle came out of the window. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that that is, yeah, that's definitely, you know, group dependent, very much something to concern yourself with at session zero. Um, and, and talk about it, because I think it is easier as a newer DM to have your party at least be familiar with each other when you start. Um, or to have have a reason to be there immediately. Um, right. And we're going to talk about you know ways to start at the end so that those are fresh in your mind if you're looking for tips like that. Um, I thought it would be cool for us to talk about the group compositions that we have, um, just to see you know sort of what that is like. 
Um, I mentioned our 7C group. Uh, I, I've got my duelist, who's you know our, our melee damage dealer. Um, kind of, I, I don't really have a lot in other stats. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Callie is playing. Uh, uh, she's what's what's the class name? A sorceress. So yeah, so she's she's a Vestenmeyer. Um, oh, I can never remember the. It's a Nordic word, but yes, she's basically a ruin witch. Yeah. Um. So she's got, and and her background is is as a Jenny, um, which is the polite term for prostitute, um. And, and something else. Uh, so she's kind of uh, a spell damage slash supporting character. Yeah. Um, and then Kristen is playing... Uh, she's also a Vestenmeyer. That's the, the Scandinavian origin equivalent. But she's um, a pirate brawler. Yeah, yep. She's a rough and tumble. She's our, our, she's our warrior. Callie's the wizard. I'm the rogue. We've got the yep. trifecta. You've got it. Yeah. Um, in my in my five E group currently, um, I, I've got somebody playing a, a hexblade warlock who's mostly melee DPS. Um, I've got a, a very very hybrid druid. Um, she she fills sort of whatever role is needed, kind of de facto healer, but not really because she doesn't want to do that role. Um, we've got a, a spell DPS and support bard. Uh, melee DPS fighter and a ranged DPS fighter. So we don't have a tank unless the druid hybrids into it. And we don't have a healer unless the druid or the bard decide to. Um, so you definitely can have long-running games without necessarily having those roles. Um, when I started this group, I had two barbarians and a druid who multiclassed rogue and then added a level of wizard. So <laughs> very, very much not standard. Um, and those are a lot of fun. Some of the non-standard things are the most fun. Um, have you ever seen the uh, the crap guides to D&D? I have not. So those are, are wicked funny. Um, some of the only YouTube videos that I will recommend because I'm not a big YouTube guy. Um, but the guy who does those is, are, is a, a talented writer, and they are very funny. And he has a joke that is uh, medium well-known amongst the 5e community where you could get a group of five clerics and call them the Amen and <laughs> just <laughs> and, and just wreak havoc over any DM's adventure because five clerics would be broken um, with how strong they would be all together. Um, so what's what's your group like, and how how do you think it works? I'm trying to think. Um, I'm playing a bard, and my role is is healing and psychological terror. Yeah, healing um, healer support. Healer support. We have a gunslinger, a paladin, a warlock, range DPS tank, melee or spell. Warlocks are kind of melee. Well, He's he 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 loves Eldritch Blast. Oh, all right. Yep. Spell loves, DPS. Loves it. Loves it. So yeah. So Gunslinger, Paladin, Warlock, Bard. Nice. No tank. Well, what's the Paladin? The, pal the Paladin. The Paladin's kind of our tank. Okay. Yeah. So you, you've kind of got a bit of a standard standard run there. Standard group. Yep. Yeah. Um. But it seems like it works, and it, it, does. it doesn't it's... impede your character development. No, we, I, my, Dolrea spends a lot of time casting healing spells when she preferred to throw cloud of daggers. Um, I mean, just throw but... the cloud of daggers. Oh, she does. Okay, <laughs> like you're not nobody, you're not obligated to heal. No, oh, she she knows. <laughs> She's neutral evil, so she'll heal if she feels if she like it. Feels like it. <laughs> but all right. So and and I we've talked a lot about different systems and how they handle. Things. We, we we have definitely. Um, yeah. I I do want I do want to touch on funnels for DCC, because um, I have been I've been reading that the the core rule book for that a little bit because i wasn't sure if we were going to get to play my main game uh this sunday um and my backup plan was to run portal under the stars which you alluded to earlier yes um yeah 
and the the funnel is terrific and uh, we've talked about it a little bit before um, but the gist is that you give depending on the number of players at your table um, you give them two to four characters who enter the portal under the stars and have a uh, pretty high chance of, of death I think they said that the the mortality rate during play tests was somewhere between like 60 and 80 yeah. percent um so you know you're you, most people will end up with one character left you might end up with two um but that there is no class at level zero in dcc you are just a dude with whatever you've got and you do the best you can well um, you you have a profession so if you're a, a profession sure but you have and and that that profession will drive kind of your starting gear. So a haberdasher starts with a pair of scissors, which counts as a dagger. Oh, uh, nice. A farmer starts with a pitchfork, which counts as a spear. Uh, yeah. Blacksmith starts with a hammer. Um, yeah, but yeah, you don't, you don't, well, so if you're an elf, a dwarf, or a halfling, your class is already pre preordained. Yes, but you don't get any benefits for that at level zero. At level zero, it's it's only when you become a proper dwarf or a proper halfling that you get your your benefits. Yeah, and that's that's very cool because um, I, I know you know we, we mentioned Call of Cthulhu as being you know you don't have a class but you've got stuff you're good at. Um, that isn't even necessarily true for DCC because if you follow the rules, you roll your stats organically. You know, you roll strength first and you put it where it is when you roll it and you keep going down the list and don't pick and choose. You just roll what you roll and roll on the table for what you are. Um, and I, I, I don't know of any other games that have that level zero classless start, um, but that is tremendously unique, and if you are feeling stale in your 5e games, DCC is very much worth a try. Still waiting on Goodman Games for that sponsorship, but... Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, it's, it's funny you mentioned that's what you're doing for your, your, um, I'm, your I'm, off I'm not, but if I get the chance, that's what I'll be doing. So, so our 5e game is actually having a down week, and we were talking about running Monarchies of Mao. Ooh, nice. Um, but uh, but some of the players feel that it's too silly. What? It's um, well, it's anthropomorphic cats. Yes. Right? If you're not familiar, Monarchies of Mao is a, a system similar to like Mouse Guard or Pugmire that gives you, you know, the fantasy of being a Redwall character or living in the frickin' Chronicles of Narnia. Like, I, if we played Mouse Guard, I would make Reaper cheap. Yeah, of course. That'd be so cool. Everybody does. I mean, that's just what you do when you play Mouse Guard. Um, actually, I'm looking at that box on the shelf right now. Uh, but so Pugmire, we were we were talking about Monarchies of Mao, and yep. some folks were like, eh, I don't know if I want to play that. And it's like, okay, how about Mutant Crawl Classics? And and I think we're going to run MCC. So, um, so what's the, the setting for that real quick? Is that so, dystopian future with radiation or is that yes. monsters? So, okay. so Mutant Crawl Classics is an homage to James Ward's epic game Gamma World from TSR um, in the 19, late 1970s. Um, and it's Thunder of the Barbarian, uh, Ralph Bakshi's Wizards, the, the world... Right, nuclear weapons, catastrophic failures. There's um, plan, you know, Planet of the Apes without the well. There's ape people, um, but there are four. You can still be a pure strain human, like a, a 21st century human being without genetic modifications. Uh, sure. You can be a mutant um, with mutant powers or or disadvantages. Could I have uh, you, gigantic ears like that one in Futurama? You could have gigantic ears. Um, you could have one ear in the middle of your forehead, like that the little girl at the orphanage. Yes. Um, nice. There are manimals, which are basically rabbits with opposable thumbs. You know, four, five foot tall rabbits with opposable thumbs who can speak English and use tools. 
Um, so think about any animal uh, walking on two or four legs and, you know, Ukul the Mock, Chewbacca, um, Chronicles of Narn, you know, you know, you know what I'm saying. And then the yeah. last one, the last one, which is a hoot, is the plantient. Oh, is that like a plan, a, a sentient like, plant? I am Groot. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> yes. Man. Yeah. Okay, very cool. And, and so, so it's it is the DCC rules, right? It's the similar. It's Goodman Games. The Mutant Crawl Classics is basically. You're you're in the Thunder the Barbarian cartoon setting, and there are um, mutant powers, and you can find shotguns and laser swords and all sorts of fantastic things. Um, so we might run that on Monday. Very cool. But that also is a funnel. Yeah, yeah. The funnel system is yeah. If you're looking for for something different completely dcc or mcc are your bag of chips yeah yeah that funnel um, is fa- fabulous it's a it's a beautiful way i mean because because the the adventure hook is why this group of people are going to do whatever they're going to do right right um and then you just go and then when you're done you have this kind of like wow we're the five people out of 22 who survived like you you kind of create bonds between the players based on what happened in the adventure like yeah you know that that trial by fire to bond people together yeah it's like which is the only reason we survived is because you cedric thought about taking the door off the hinges and using it as a giant shield or else we would have all been killed (laughs) hooray cedric right um, or, or you, Jenny, sacrificed your goose by throwing it down the hallway to see where the pits were. <laughs> Man, we're really we'll have to buy you a new goose when we get out of the dungeon. Right. It definitely creates more like organically novel encounters and memories than you know, a preset module in D and D with a wizard, a cleric, a fighter, and a rogue. Yeah. Not to yeah. say that that's bad. If that's the game you want to play, do it up. But there are tons of other ways to do it which is a perfect segue into our mission and vision portion um and and i i don't know we had to learn this several times when i was in friggin high school because nobody knew what the difference was so i'm just gonna outline it as i understand it um mission is what is your party's goals immediately and vision is where you see yourself in the future right um and I, i think of vision as being something more individual or you know dependent on the dice because you can't you know i I don't know what's going to happen necessarily but um and and maybe vision is more of an individual thing so like in 7c uh, you the dm have a vision i think the dm always has a vision um yeah for how they kind of want their story to go but as far as us as players the only vision that we really sort of get is how we die how our story comes to an end um which is a cool sort of it's not mechanical but it's you know a rules thing that you should write um but that is is pretty cool uh mission on the other hand is you know what our party is doing and so at the present we're working to help uh the old man find his alleged daughter um and so we, we you you mentioned that it is a little bit me, it's a little bit meta um, to to consider your party's vision at the start. Um, it's a it's a little bit, but I, I think I think great parties either develop a mission or they a they, vision they a, a a vision they either develop a vision or they have one before they start right right and yeah. and it could be right we're going to be uh, the the best thieves in lankmar right that's our vision you know in five years from now we're all going to be sitting in a posh hideout with dancing girls and all the wine we can drink and it'll be great that's that's a vision mm-hmm. right um 
I think that's one of the things that Glorantha, RuneQuest Glorantha gets right. It creates that vision for the party, even before they're, they're, they're a party. Um, same thing with the One Ring. The fellowship rules in, in the One Ring kind of set that vision. Successful parties will, no matter how they're composed, kind of get that vision because it helps people stay coherent, right? Mm -hmm. there, there's a reason that I'm going to hang out with you guys instead of, hey, cool, you know, we kicked this butt. We, we're done drinking at the tavern. I'm going to go to my house and you guys go to your house. And we, right, it's, it's group dynamics. I mean, it really is. I mean, we can, we can just look at team and group dynamics in the real world and look at successful organizations and teams and companies uh, and see how mm -hmm. they interact with each other, right? Versus like unsuccessful places, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, yeah, I don't. I don't like identifying it as a matter of success because um, I, I think the real world definition of success isn't are you having a fun life, which sure. is the version of success for games. So okay, um, I, I I understand the point though. You know, you don't want a bunch of characters who are very disjointed, not you know, agreeing. You know, if you're sitting there in character creation and you have somebody who wants to be an evil warlock who eventually wants to become a lich and take over this famous castle while the player opposite them wants to be a paladin in service to the king who lives in that castle, like, you're going to end up with player conflict. And, sure. like, we've talked about it before, like, if PvP is something you want, then establish that in Session Zero, and maybe that leads to a really cool adventure where these two people are working together this whole time up until, like, a final battle, and one of them gets to win the win the D&D &D game, which I, I hate saying. <laughs> I hate saying, but if that's what you want to play at, at Session Zero, then just establish that and do it. Um but as a DM, it is challenging when you have players say to you, I, I don't know why my character is here. Um, and I, I had a little bit of that immediately after Connie the Bard joined the party because he was like, I, I don't really know what I'm, I'm doing with these people. Like, I've got my great backstory. I've got a great character that I love and I want to play, but like, I, I need a reason like these guys were were around when I was around, and they you know saw me perform, and they were looking for a place to stay. So I, I gave them rooms in my friend's house, and we hung out, and we listened to some stories together, and we, we're going to go investigate this thing tomorrow. But after that, you know, I, I want to have a reason to stay. Right, and um, that's and that's that's that vision that that the party has to kind of build, like, or. It could be the mission that you, as the DM, set before them, which is the route that I took, because they didn't. So, they didn't so the, vision together. The the, the mission is going to help. the The mission is going to I don't want to say force, but facilitate. Facilitate. That's a perfect word. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the The mission is going to facilitate either creating a vision or coming to the realization that yeah, when when we're done and we've we've got the chest of gems back to the king, you know, you guys have a good time. You're 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 nice folks, and it was fun fighting with you. But I'm I'm on my own, mm -hmm. um, right? You you, you want to build camaraderie, right? And that's I mean that's what I'm trying to do in the Seventh Sea adventure. Um, is is try to keep you guys more together. Um, I, so, I don't think it's a problem yet, but. When it's like, okay, you've all got rooms like the – you're all going to get rooms in the school and you're like, yeah, I'm not doing that. It's like, oh. Well, so ah. I didn't I didn't not do it to not be with my party. I didn't right. do it because I didn't want to impose on a woman who already seemed like she was handling enough. Right. And, and maybe that's, you know, the fault of my character not being pushy enough. Or maybe no. it's your fault for not – identifying that like hey people like there's not inns in a place like this you either live on the street or you go mm -hmm. find a tree outside of the town or um no it, and and it it again it didn't detract from the game mm -hmm. i just i i have a note about 
trying to keep you guys. I, I put that as a note for me in session two is try to keep people together more closely. Sure. Sure. And, uh, and, and yes. And, and I know that you didn't want to impose upon Donatella, but she's not a nice lady. So yeah, but I'm a nice your guy. Character, your character's a nice guy. You just met her. You don't know. She's a, a, a B word. Um, right. Maybe if I find out that she isn't a nice person, then I'll care a little less. But until then, right. Right. Yeah. Right. So, session one. We got a lot. We got a long way to go. <laughs> we got a long way to go. We do. Um, so uh, the last thing that I want to touch on here, uh, and we can talk about it a little bit if you feel comfortable disclosing a little DM insight or, or GM insight for seven C. Sure. Um, is, is ways to, to start, right? So I think we're still at a point early on in the development and creation of this this podcast, this show, where we're still kind of directing content at newer GM DMs. Sure. Um, and so it, I think it is prudent, as we've been talking about this, to to sort of outline a couple of ways that you could start games that, that, help support your players in achieving that shared vision. Um, and the first thing that I thought of uh, when I started writing the notes for this was the Vampire the Masquerade game that you gm for, like, I don't know, God, 10 years ago? Oh, right. Yeah. And so if I, remem was... if I remember that one correctly... We were, I was a college professor, and Matt and Kristen were, um, one of them was a, like an athlete at the college, and the other one was a, I don't, I don't remember. I don't um, remember either, but um, yeah, so that, I, when I was, that was a storyteller decision, um, because that was your very first Vampire the Masquerade game. Right. Uh, and you guys were all relatively young and uh, were not necessarily interested in reading the entire rule book before we played, um, which is fine. That's, that's not a dig at all. Don't, don't take that as a dig. Oh, no. Um, I, I was, I was, in, I was we, in college. The girls were in school. We were, we were going to sit down. We're going to play this game. I think you were in high school when we started that. that. Maybe, maybe when we started. Yeah. But, but so – that was the perfect way to like, okay, you three are going to become vampires because the vampires around you have <laughs> that's noticed the point you. Of the game. You're 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 extraordinarily exciting or, or interesting humans and we're gonna turn you into vampires. Here are the rules, right? And that way I could introduce the rules and the theme and kind of set you guys together in a way um, that it wouldn't be easy for you to, ah, I'm a vampire, I have special powers, peace out, drop my mic and, and head to Milwaukee where I can do other things, you know, because I've always wanted to move to Milwaukee and be a vampire there. Sure. Um, so, so that was as a, that, that was one tactic. And I guess that's kind of where my mind is going when I'm looking through this list is if you're a new GM, there are some tropes and some some I don't want to call them cliches because it has a negative connotation, but cliches. No, tr trope for lack is, of a better trope, trope covers it um, for for how to get a group together and really borrow from literature, television, movies. Like think about how uh, a movie starts. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the well, one of the best party like if you've ever seen the usual suspects i have not so it's a movie they're all criminals they don't know each other but they all were called by this mafia boss who they've done work with um and told to be at a bar at a certain time or else they're gonna regret their life choices and so <laughs> Right. They, all these. Right. There's a there's a loan shark guy. There's a guy who breaks people's legs for a living. There's a computer the carjacker, hacker, carjacker. 
Right. They're all sitting around Don't and they're Judy. all trying to figure out why they're in this room together. And then there's that one, right? You, you all did business with this guy and you screwed him over. It's like, oh, okay. And, <laughs> and it's just, it's just a weird, I mean, the whole move, a lot of the movie is trying to figure out like, why are we here? Uh, but that's, that's a great way. There's the, you know, so wait, the ex- before, before we get too far, I want to go back to the okay. vampire game. Cause even sure. your, your decision to lay out the rules was brilliant being that we were unfamiliar with the system. But even before that, um, when we were ordinary people, the story was such that we, you know, were asked to come to this meeting. It was kind of sketchy. Um, but then the choice was become a vampire or we're going to eat you. Um, and, you know, psychologically, we all had that sort of harrowing experience that we survived. Uh, and so right from the beginning, we had nobody else that we could trust or rely on. And that Right. I don't want to say forced a bond, but you know, what other choice what other choice did we have? Right. Um so creating a bond by the limitation or the creation of an illusion of choice. Right. So what other example were you gonna give for that? So no, I was I was I was headed off to the well there's the intense action sequence right Mm -hmm. um so i'm I'm trying to think of a good example of that where there's a there's a hook and and um everyone's kind of in it together now because of this thing that happened right um i'm trying to think of a good one i'm thinking like bojack horseman when they all uh, when the house sinks, because Mr. Peanut Butter agrees to allow the drillers to frack in his front yard. Sure. Yep. Um, if if you're familiar with that. But then, um, yeah, that's that's that kind of, um, you know, the bus breaks down on a country road in the middle of the night. Kind yeah. Of thing. Yep. Right. Oh, you know, very, yeah. very, very murder. She wrote. We're 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 all kind of strangers and. Um, this thing happens and now we're, we're in a situation together. Uh, it's clear that it's a risky situation. We have to work together to get, to get out. Kind mm-hmm. of. So that's so, a little, that's a little trickier, I think, cause you could end it, up with like Lord of the flies type scenarios. Sure. Oh, absolutely. You could get, you could get a, uh, alpha gamer who says, this is the way it's going to be or else, you know, you're the first person on the buffet line when we run out of food. Yeah. Um, Gosh. But that's yeah, that's I mean the 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 standard trope is everyone shows up at the town tavern and they start the module, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and that's well, it, so it's, it's, it's difficult not... though to to play that, uh, especially for a new. I think for a new DM, that's that's a real hard. That's a that's a big ask. Oh yeah, because for, for you, a new you're DM. putting. It's it's also tough for new players too, because um, I I had one of my longtime experienced players have uh, their um, significant other join us for a session. She had never played any tabletop. Uh, she played ten candles once with him, um, and and I made the rookie mistake. I'm not a rookie, but I make rookie mistakes. Um, we all do. Yeah. Of of making I with all positive intention, I made a chunk of the story revolve around her character, and so I put her. You know, you arrived to the town. What would you like to do? You had to come here to meet with this person, and she just was at a loss for a little while. And I was like, well, I, I had to sort of work her through it. You know, if if you were in a new town looking for somebody, you know, where would you, who would you go, where would you go to ask? Uh, you know, a sheriff's office, a library, a coffee shop, um, whatever it would be. And we we got there eventually, but even if it had been you are all in the tavern, it's not so likely. Like, when was the last time that you went to a bar and you interacted with somebody who you had never met before? 
I think I've done that maybe twice in my life. Right. I, I've done it maybe once or twice, and I haven't ever talked to them again. So, right. like, as as common of a trope as that is, it's not something that, like, makes sense realistically. Unless, of course, everybody meets up in the tavern and somebody sees some fireballs get thrown outside and the tavern is under attack by some bandits and your, you know, three or four party members happen to be the only ones with any skill or talent outside of brawling. And now you've got a group of people thrown into sort of that harrowing situation, you know, survive or die. Um, and they they work together and, and now they kind of want to find out what, what happens, right? That was my original... Two years ago, when I started the group that I started now, I, I had three players, and each of their characters were um, sort of interested in in this notice that had been put out about disappearances in this small town. So they all went to find out what was going on, ended up working together to solve the one mystery, only to then find a clue that they all continued to want to figure out. Um, so I gave them the mission, you know, solve the mystery of the disappearances, and uh, a, a cookie crumb to the vision. Here's, you know, the beginning of the next step. What do you guys want to do? And they were all, hey, what's the deal with this? Let's find out more. How, how do we do that? Where do we go? Um, so, so for new DMs, clear hooks, harrowing situations, um, or create relationships in session zero yes characters you could it, it is understated how easy it is compared to the tavern start to do okay you guys are all adventurers you've you know you all know each other you've been adventuring for five years at this point um you know you probably don't know everything about each other but you, you know you know your names you know your skills and you are arriving at x place to do y thing and that's right. where you're like that's how curse of strahd starts you know the party is a pre-established group of adventurers who are off to to begin their next quest when they are whisked away by the mists into the land of barovia right. i think that's i think it's one of the starts but i think that's the best one um but yeah and, no it's 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 and and it doesn't have to be a like oh well, you're my you're my wife or you're my best friend and we've grown up together. It could be like, you know, we, we met on the road about a month and a half ago and it's, it's a fantasy setting. So, you know, uh, a journey of a hundred miles is several days. Yeah. Right. You're, you're not going to walk in silence for four days. You're going to chat. Yeah. Right. E even and, on and, the road is better than the tavern start. Cause then yeah. you have that, you know, we're going to do, Session zero, we, we finished up, we've got a half an hour to spare. You guys are on the road, you've just met. You can describe your characters and chat a little bit, and, and that, that's, that's a, a nice kind of, kind of organic way to, to let characters meet and begin to create a bit of a vision. Yeah, or, or even, it's a little artificial, but uh, stat out or friendship. It doesn't oh, have mecha totally. mechanical stats, but you could say, okay, I'm a half orc bard who loves the hammer of dulcimer, and you're, uh, oh, you're a centaur. Cool. Um, my, oh, you know, and, and this is just, we haven't talked about being, doing impromptu um, or on the fly creation, but you could say something like, you know, my dad was a blacksmith and a farrier. He used to shoe horses all the time. And I started talking to the centaur. Hey, do you guys wear, you know, I know it's a personal question, but do you guys wear <laughs> shoes? And, you know, you start up this conversation and now, now you kind of start, you, you just write down friend with. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And then, and then as you're playing the game, I think this is one of the things that newer players and newer DMs kind of, they get so wrapped up in the the mechanics, the rolling and the, do I have line of sight? Do I get an attack of opportunity? What's going on here? That right. they forget kind of the, well, you guys are in a melee combat situation with your friend. Right. And, and if you, you know, if you are in, let's say you're hanging out with your real life friends, 
and a bar fight goes down and you see your real life friend get hit with a glass bottle and start bleeding, you are going to have a reaction. Yeah. Right. And, and that's going to generate role play. Like, are you okay? (laughs) I'm going to make sure I'm not going to get punched, but maybe I'm going to go check on my friend before like I go looking to put my sword through somebody else's head. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that that's, we talked a little bit about combat. We haven't, we haven't talked about, we haven't done the, the show on uh, narrating combat yet, have we? Nope, it's on the list. But, um, but that's one of those things that I think players will, like, yeah, hey, we've been together for s- four months. Hey, let's, let's we're going to, you know, we're, yep, we're done the combat. What does the guy got in his pockets? He's got 10 gold. <laughs> Okay, there's five of us. There's two for you, two for you, two for you, two for you. It's like, wait a minute. That's your buddy, and you just watched him get hurt really bad. Mm-hmm. Are you sure you're going to go to, you know, we're, we're, we're going to do an even Steven split here? Um, and yeah, you want to, inc- that's that's sort of encouraging the RP. Right. Um, and and the, the last thing that I want to touch on is is bringing new players in once the game has already started. Um, which, again, can be as easy as, uh, you know, uh, the first Lord of the Rings where all the hobbits are in a room and the guy and the stranger, all, all of you are in the tavern and there's a guy who comes up to you and asks a favor of one member of your party and now everybody's involved and that person's involved and hey, hooray, you're together again. Um, it can be as simple as that or... Most recently, I brought somebody new into my game, um, and he wanted to play uh, this archaeologist background, very Indiana Jones-style character. Um, And originally, I was going to have them meet at the gates. You know, I've got a party of, you know, fairly experienced players who enjoy RP, so they were just going to meet at the gates and maybe rendezvous or bump into each other later. But... I have been trying to weave subtle connections between the characters more to, to build a little bit more of that party-based vision. Um, and so his character, uh, in game time, two weeks before now, was asked by the guy, the quest giver, who the party is going to meet to go and get him this relic from a, a dungeon. He's, he's, he's Indiana Jones, so he's just, he goes to find the pieces of things in the places he shouldn't be. Um, so he, he finds the fragment of the relic, and he brings it to uh, the quest giver while the party is meeting with him. And so they sort of get to talk with him a little bit. The relic is something that has a little bit of uh, religious significance to the druid, um, and so they, they've got a little bit of a connection there. And then that evening, they were all poisoned. And so now he's working with the party to find out who did it. And in hopes of like eventually having the party help him find the other pieces of this relic. Um, so that that's a pretty, pretty well thought out example. Very specific to my players in my group. Um, but that's uh, an option for bringing people into the game after... They have not. Have you had anybody join your game? So I joined when when I joined my group. I jo- I joined Curse of Strahd already in progress. Oh, how did um, that work? So I had a, a fairly good backstory. Right, I'm a. We already talked about my method acting, and I had a long creative backstory. And uh, basically, I got dimension doored into Barovia while fighting Drow in the Underdark. Oh, and whoa. Um, so the I forget, I, I don't remember the module well enough, but there's a house that the party was going to investigate and a ghost barmaid tempted my dwarven cleric into a closet with promises of beer and and uh, bosoms and <laughs> he got locked in a closet. <laughs> oh, so All right. Th- this this happens a few hours before the party arrives. So they arrive at the house and they can hear uh, dwarvish cursing and banging and um, 
and they go into the house and and find me and i explain what i'm doing there and nice and uh and they said well we're 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 in barovia we got sent here as well um you're you're have you're more than welcome to tag along because we don't have a cleric with us wink wink nudge nudge um and uh and that's kind of how how that happened so yeah so like so so this is part i think that that that's a good little wraparound to like why having a role or a class identity is good is that it, it helps drive that party comp party uh, a little bit of the party vision in that you know hey we, we might want somebody who's a little if we're four rogues and a wizard we, we might want somebody who wants to stand in front of of everyone else um, yeah we, we definitely need that cavalier yeah yeah everyone everyone talks paladin that's uh, cavaliers where it's at <laughs> very cool um that's how we beat straw i think that was that how we beat straw a cavalier high level cavalier has an ability called lockdown mm. so once you issue your challenge that any it this is pat pathfinder cavalier no this is this is 5e the, oh, there's cool. a cavalier in uh xanathar's guide it's a it's a fighter sub subtype yes um, subclass and and he gets so you issue a challenge anyone who so you know you must fight me evildoer i challenge you your your honor is you can hold your honor nigh if you don't strike me first and now they have to roll with disadvantage against everybody else but at higher levels um the cavalier can basically lock up uh, a foe so they can't move so once once they engage in melee with the cavalier and the Cavaliers issued their challenge, they get locked down. So even if they try to move, they, they can't move. Um, oh, yep. Uh, at 10th so level. At 10th level. Um, so we, we were fighting Strahd, and of course Strahd has all of these legendary actions where he can mist away and misty step and yada yada. And it's like, uh, no. Yep. He, 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 even if you're missed, your speed is still zero. He... he he hit me, and I'm engaged with him. So he turns into a pile of mist, and then he pff, reconstitutes right back in front of the cavalier. And everyone's like, "Yay!" <laughs> <laughs> nice. You're not going cool. anywhere, bastard! Boom, boom, boom. So the big takeaway about roles and party composition is have a cavalier. <laughs> yeah. Now, now I'm just being. Biased. No, no, that's fun. Towards, it's towards fun. my favorite class. Cavaliers but, are red. Um, yeah, I don't know. Do you have any, any closing thoughts on this? I, I don't, I guess, I guess we've, we've talked a lot about mechanics and you might think about this. You might think about that. I think I used the should word a couple of times. Um, the thing to remember is to have fun. If you have a table and they all want to play, right? We all want to be skittermander envoys, like fine play skittermander envoys it'll be a blast that, that would be that would actually be a hilarious game starfinder game to play yeah. um just as the dm you need to kind of balance out what your character what your players have picked for characters with the adventure that you're playing mm -hmm. and in that session zero help your characters build that vision and relationship regardless of what their roles are uh, and and that will help you out immensely as well. Yep, and 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 try to build it as you go. Um, my yeah, my it, close. Oop, go ahead. It that that will make it more organic and natural. It won't be forced. Like oh yeah, I I need to give you. I need to buy you a drink because we're friends. No, you're you're buddies. You're, yeah, be friends. Be friendly. Um, I think my closing tip is just to reiterate something that I said earlier. Uh, was that. You know, encourage your players to play whatever kind of character that they will have fun with and not worry about filling a role. Um, I, I've got one player who is often concerned about filling a role because he wants to do something different that other players don't do. And it took me a little while to realize he's not trying to fill the role so that we can have the comp. He's trying to fill the role so that he can have a unique character because that's how he has fun with the game. 
So encourage your players to play what they would have fun with, and if that is something different, that's that's okay too. Sweet. So that's going to do it for Set the Table episode 13. Uh, thanks a whole lot for listening. If you would like to comment on the show or ask a question, um, feel free to do so through Twitter. Uh, you can tweet at JMSCO to 5 or at Red Hoodie Games. Um, we mentioned starting adventures outside of a tavern, so I'm going to plug uh, redhoodygames5.wordpress.com. There is a blog post there titled 1D12 Places to Start an Adventure Besides a Tavern. Um, and so if you're looking for a hook to start an adventure and you don't want to have it be that trope, uh, check that out. And uh, finally, if you would like to support the show in any way other than simply just watching, uh, head on over, or listening rather, um, head on over to patreon.com slash skoda, where even a dollar will grant you access to our patron discord. You can hang out with us, play games with us, chat, ask questions, um, and have potentially questions answered on the show, all of the like and above. Uh, so thanks a whole lot, and that's going to do it. Good day.